Welcome to another episode of the Speakeasy Podcast. Today, we are thrilled to have Charles Carson from Memorial Care. Charles is a seasoned talent acquisition leader and talent advisor in the healthcare sector. For his expertise in sourcing strategies, candidate engagement, and leveraging advanced technology to attract highly skilled candidates. With a background in talent acquisition operations and sourcing management, let's dive into his insights on fostering those relationships, developing strong candidate pipelines, and staying at the forefront of healthcare recruitment. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Charles Carson. So welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. I look forward to our discussion today. Awesome. We always ask every single guest, how did you get into the world of talent acquisition, sourcing, recruiting, especially within the healthcare system? Yeah, interesting story. I've kind of learned over time. Most people, It's not a straight line. No one just ends up in recruitment. They don't go to school and say, I want to be a recruiter one day. It just kind of falls on you. I was working in HR for about eight, nine years. And when I was working in HR, the one aspect I really enjoyed of the, of the job because I was a singular HR person was actually going out and speaking to people at universities and doing the recruitment aspect. And then one day it just kind of clicked. I'm like, this is what I'm good at. This is what I want to do. That was kind of my career trajectory at that point was to move over into recruitment, start working in different areas. I worked in the federal sector. Um, then I worked in healthcare. Then I left healthcare for a short amount of time, went over to agency, and now I've come back to healthcare. So really it was one of those areas where I didn't see myself, but somehow I landed here and I found the exact place that I was supposed to be. Tell me what your role is right now and a little bit about your company. I'm currently with Memorial Care. I've been here a little bit over a year at this point and uh, kind of interesting how things happen. And I came to Memorial Care. I was currently working for an agency and I got approached by a former colleague of mine who was moving into a role in TA. He'd been hunting me for many years to try to come to different organizations that uh, he was working at. But he finally, he finally came to the table. He's like, this is the one, this is the position that I really kind of thought of you for versus some of the other ones that might not have been a direct fit. When he brought it forward and he kind of pitched it to me that it was going to be a complete overhaul of the overall TA processes at Memorial Care, where we were going to look more into developing SLAs, um, building an entire sourcing component, which Memorial Care did not have, and to basically have a singular focus at that point in time to reduce our reliance on agency spend for nursing as well as non-nursing areas. So it sounded exciting to me, especially with the capabilities of building out our own sourcing component. So when I came on board, there was a total of, I want to say nine of us. Most of them were only dedicated to recruitment. They kind of dabbled here and there in the sourcing aspects, but they didn't really go into the robust capabilities of sourcing and finding candidates. So when I came on board, we kind of designated how we want sourcing to look and what kind of uh, resources we're going to need for that. So we built out a team. There's five of us at this point, small but mighty, as I like to say. So uh, we brought in some individuals. Uh, a couple were known to us from uh, other areas. We brought a couple in from uh, some different competitors, ours from the local community, so that we could have a little bit more information about the area and kind of some of the tactics of those competitors. When we brought them in, it was kind of like just a nice melding. Um, it's like everybody had their own kind of spe specific veins. So uh, we have a person who's really strong in those hard to fill leadership roles in IT. Then we have one who I like to call our nurse whisperer. I'm not sure how she does it, but for some reason, she can find any nurse that we've needed so far. We have one that works really well in ancillary areas. And then our other is a lead sourcing strategist who really partners with me to build out our strategy for sourcing candidates, how we want to move forward, different projects we want to roll out, um, which one was uh, Hire Easy uh, was one of the ones that we partnered on to make sure we brought that to the organization because I'd worked with Hire Easy at a previous organization and have been basically on the platform through multiple different areas for about eight-ish years. So quite a while. The exciting thing about Memorial Care right now is we're, we're expanding. We have, are bringing in new service lines as an overall organization, which has really challenged us in the TA space where we're having to find individuals in spaces that we might not have recruited in before, which gives us the opportunity to cross-leverage sourcing a lot more where sure. we're kind of delving into that market and trying to find the candidates that we need for certain positions. It's been an amazing journey for me so far with Memorial Care. And when I came on board, you always have that, I'm not really sure what that's going to feel like. But uh, after about two weeks, I realized that, you know, the culture, the direction that the entire organization was going, the buy-in that our executive leadership team had put into TA for us to continue uh, pushing forward into those next steps of recruiting and really bringing Memorial Care to a newer place as far as talent acquisition. As you branch out within your organization, supporting different functions, how do you balance between inbound and outbound recruiting methods in the healthcare industry, uh, considering, you know, the deficit of talent in the marketplace currently right now? Yeah, so that is definitely a challenge, especially when you're looking at nursing. So I know nobody wants to hear the P word. You know, we're kind of over talking about the pandemic, but uh, I have to bring it up because it is still a very prevalent piece in healthcare. So during that time frame, um, massive burnout was very common, uh, especially in the RN realms. They were selected to do monumental tasks. And there's only so long that you can do something monumental before it actually starts taking its toll on you mentally and physically. And with that, uh, we saw pretty strange change in the market where you had seasoned nurses that were walking away from that as their uh, occupation of choice. So a lot of seasoned nurses, really highly experienced nurses were leaving the entire industry to go do other things because of the toll that it took. So where we've been is from a sourcing perspective, we had to start 
rebuilding or building pipelines of candidates. We needed to talk to our internal folks, try to get an idea of people who they might know so that we could get referrals. Then we started working on different campaigns and starting to leverage social media, which was something that was also lacking to try to get more information out about to Memorial Care, not just from we have jobs available for you, but more as holistically where we're providing everything from the service lines all the way down to opportunities that are available. Is that more like brand marketing from Memorial right. Care? That was the first step was to really get the brand recognition out there. Um, and the amazing thing, and this is something that was new to me, uh, especially in healthcare, was having a marketing team who was like, what do you need? How can we help? From my experience, usually there's a separation between marketing and TA. They're like, oh, you're doing career branding. Go do that. We're going to stay on the enterprise and service line side. So the two are always separated. But when we came to the table, um, our vice president marketing, he is the one who approached us and said, how can we help you? So it's been a really collaborative approach from the marketing side as TA working in one singular unit versus having those two separated areas. So we're getting the branding piece for the organization and we're getting the career branding at the same time, which then allows us to do the individual outreaches where more than likely they have run across some of our ads on some form of social media and have some awareness of us as a company. The big question I always hear within healthcare, where do you find these nurses, these practitioners, because typically they're not on LinkedIn. Where do I find these type of individuals? The best practice is putting on a sandwich board and walking up and down the highway. No, I'm totally kidding. You know, looking for nurses is definitely a challenge. You know, uh, when you talk to a lot of recruiters, their first instinct is LinkedIn. And in no way, shape or form am I going to say LinkedIn is not an avenue to take. Um, that's what I like to call the low-hanging fruit. Definitely go look on LinkedIn. Send some messages. You never know. It could happen. But you're absolutely right. Nurses aren't typically sitting in front of a computer all day. They're not uh, checking their phone continuously because they are doing patient care. So what we found is through the partnership with HireEasy, which has been absolutely amazing, we have found that that has been a key way for us to speak with nurses. They are more apt to respond to a short-winded email than they are to outreaches on LinkedIn because that's not requiring them to go into a whole separate, separate platform that they might not even have their uh, username and password preset so it automatically opens. Whereas an email, that's going to pop up. Nice little subject line. Here's some quick informational. And then the one piece that I love that you guys offer right now is the pool. That has been amazing for us because instead of them having to type, yes, I'm interested, they can actually just hit that pull button saying yes, no, maybe. And then that pushes back towards our sourcing team. So we, we know exactly how to engage them going forward. If it's a yes, then that's when they're going to get the follow-up email saying, hey, we'd love to schedule some time. Let's utilize one of the camp calendaring pieces that are out there. Make it nice and easy for them where they can pick the time regardless of what it is. They have the option to look at our calendar, select what works best for them. So those two in tandem have been absolutely amazing. If it's a maybe, then that's one that we just send a nice little follow-up email. But we'd love to continue communications. If you'd be open to us speaking with you, please let us know. If not, we'll 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 keep your you know typical recruitment tagline. We'll keep your resume on file or your information on file and we'll follow up with, with you over time, which is also not a dead piece to us, which I've seen in some spaces. We actually leverage that for campaigns just to kind of trickle out a little bit more information about Memorial Care. Some of the successes we're having when we receive certain al um, accolades from different areas, our magnet status gets renewed. We always kind of push those in front of those nurses so that they know that we are still moving forward and we're not considered a stagnant healthcare organization. Awesome. You see that the response rate or the engagement rate is higher because it's an email or a text message, or Absolutely. how do you measure success with those campaigns? Yeah, so we look at it in a couple of different aspects. Obviously, responses are huge, right? That's our primary is looking at email responses, text message responses, and also making and also looking at those bounce rates. So one thing I have noticed over all my time working uh, with high the platform is that the bounce rate is relatively low. That's why it's a huge bonus for us to utilize the platform. But uh, when we're looking at those, we're even looking at those, they opened it. So if they opened it, they probably read enough of it to understand who we are, which then gives us those follow-up capabilities going, okay, this will be someone we want to follow up and continue pushing something in front of them about Memorial Care as an organization. But uh, definitely the response rates and the response to text messages are our two largest um, because that at least gives us an idea of, are we hitting the right audience? If they're responding, then we are hitting the right audience and ensuring that where our sources have the capabilities of at least having some form of communication with them, either to progress them into presentation to a hiring manager or to disposition them out or to pipeline them for future outreaches. If someone's new into the healthcare system, how do they get a job? Let's just say I went to school, nurse for four years. Now I'm looking to get into, you know, a well-established career within a good company and a good hospital system. Typically, what is that progression and how does someone get noticed? Yeah. So one of the most difficult pieces that I've seen career-wise is when nurses are leaving the, their nursing uh, degree and they're moving into how do I get my foot in the door with a specific organization. Uh, it can be challenging because when any facility opens their new grads uh, positions, which is how they're considered first, where they come in, go through uh, preceptorship, and then they also have the educational components, it is so competitive in that market. So my recommendation that I've had to new grads and I've heard success from, I can't say it works for all, but one thing I always recommend is that they actually leverage some of the different platforms out there and see if they can find who one of those internal recruiters to that organization. Now, it might not be the right recruiter, 
But the same token, that recruiter might be able to do an induction to the right recruiter. And that way you can have a conversation with them because every organization's new grad programs are always looking for something a little bit different. Here at Memorial Care, we have uh, a mul multitude of new grads with all of, our, all of our facility openings twice a year for each campus. So that's six opportunities that someone would have to join the Memorial Care team. So with that, we are expanding our careers page right now. We're in a complete rebuild of that, which fingers crossed is going to be amazing because that's also one of my projects. What we're actually adding is specific content so they can get a hold of that new grad recruiter. You know, as well as I do, the more two conversations you have, the more you understand about the organization, the more you understand about the process, the more you understand about what they're looking for. You can tweak your resume to such, you know exactly what they're looking for. You can speak to it, and then you can speak to your educational background and how it relates to uh, the opportunity that you're going for. And one thing we've seen amazing success for is we actually have opened up our new grads to move directly into some of the specialties. So a lot of what I've seen historically is your new grad, you're going to go into med surge, you're going to go into tele or one of those other units before you have the opportunity to go to specialty. Whereas we'll take a new grad straight out of school and have them go into the ICU cath lab. We'll actually bring new grads into all those areas, which has been a huge success for us and has generated a lot more applications because we do have that option. Another cool thing that we've launched is and kind of uh, come hang out with Memorial Care for our new grad nurses. We invite them to all of our campuses. Our CNO comes down and speaks to them. And we have all of the hiring managers throughout the organization come through and mingle with the new grads. So the new grads have the opportunity to ask, well, let, let me know a little bit about your department. What are some of the great things? What works well here? What kind of personalities? They get to ask all of those really ingrained questions, those hiring managers, and hear directly from the source versus hearing it from a recruiter, which we've also seen a lot of value in because they're really hearing what the day-to-day -day, uh, look of that floor is so that they can make a decision if that's potentially the direction they want to head. So we have a whole lot of different irons in the fire trying to attract new grads so that they are hearing everything they can about us to make a decision if we're the employer of choice. Is it typically a season of new hire grad hiring with campus recruiting and job fairs? And that's more of the inbound sourcing. Right. Is there a next wave of rediscovering those candidates, maybe year two, year three? Walk me through kind of that strategy of inbound, outbound, specifically new grads. Yeah, for, for our new grads, I, I haven't come across a really robust tool that is ease of use for us to reach out to new grads. Most of them are the entire umbrella, you know, anything under higher education, you can find those components. And it does have drill downs to individuals who might be in that specific major, but it's not always tried and true. So what we found is building partnerships with educational facilities is the most important step you can take. Because if you are in communication with the educators at that campus or some of the nurses who are doing the education for those folks, then our name will start getting dropped more like, hey, Memorial Care has new grad openings that'll be happening. Um, and also what we've done is partner with those where we can get information out like flyers. Hey, we have new grad openings. Here's what it looks like. Here are the opportunities that are available. So it's really approaching the schools and building that relationship um, where we're kind of also, I don't want to say employer of choice, but we're kind of the one that they will refer to because they see us more than others. So that's been probably one of the key pieces that we've seen success wise is building the relationship with the educational facilities who are producing or having the students come out of where they can make a recommendation. You know, they look to the seasoned nurses who are doing those educations where might be a good place for me to land. And if we are ingrained enough with those educators in that facility, we're always top of mind when they're talking to their students about, oh, well, I know Memorial Care is going to have some openings. That's not always the case, but I would say more often than not, we get a lot of referrals specifically from the educational facility. So really building those partnerships and relationships has been pivotal to our success in the new grad program. Where do you see the biggest opportunity within healthcare recruit to help recruiters, sourcers really attract and retain the top talent? That's like that magic question. Healthcare, from my perspective, always runs slightly behind the trends, right? So with healthcare, I would say probably up to about 10 years ago, roughly, um, with the post and pray, right? Post a position, pray someone applies, let's, let's try to fill it with whoever comes in. So it's really been kind of a dynamic shift in healthcare where certain individuals are coming in from, you know, like the Googles, the Amazon, those that have been doing high level sourcing for candidates for a long time. That was one piece that I wanted to hire on my sourcing team was someone who had a background from one of those uh, big IT companies because I know how they go through the sourcing process and candidate attraction process. And that's been a huge plus for me is that they're leveraging technology space in the healthcare space because that technology space is extremely competitive and it makes healthcare look like, I don't know, a cup of tea in comparison. I brought in uh, two individuals that actually had worked for, uh, one was from Meta, one was from Amazon. And I brought both of those in because I wanted to have that capability where we can pivot faster. So being that healthcare has run behind that trend, um, I think that's one of the most difficult pieces uh, is for healthcare organizations to relearn um, and adapt to what has changed in the market. So, I mean, there's a lot of really great uh, tools that are out there, ones that you can utilize that helps you bridge that gap between where the IT sector is now to where healthcare is to make us uh, a lot more nimble, a lot more capable of reaching out to these candidates on time, I guess you could say. And I always say on time and people always kind of look at me a little strange about it, but on time. And I mean, by on time as in what is right for them. You know, it's, it, it's really trying to find that space where healthcare 
recruitment and IT recruitment, you kind of look at them as they should be the same because there is so much competition in the healthcare space, especially with, you know, educational facilities for nursing. They've changed a lot of their operations where it used to be they had a, a designated cohort that went through all the way to graduation. Now it's okay, sign up, you're waitlisted. Um, well, we have this one class available, one class available here, or there, and you have to kind of piece it together versus the old way where it was more of kind of a strategic path. So that being the case, that kind of speaks to my point, we have to catch those people in time. So that's where we really have to track them through, you know, different means from internal perspectives, as well as leveraging some of those platforms where you can get a little bit better understanding of where they might be um, in their overall sure. career or their career journey. So you know when that you need to engage them. But that's kind of the biggest advice that I would give is really take a hard look at what Meta and Amazon and some of those huge IT companies are doing and what are their strategies for finding candidates? Because if you can deploy similar strategies, then you might become that name just like Amazon, because I'm pretty sure anybody who's listening to this, there's nobody out there that doesn't know who Amazon is, either from a career branding perspective, which we all see constantly, or from just the brand awareness. And that's the piece that really has been helpful is having these folks that had that background. They're doing a lot of our advertisements. They're really spearheading a lot of the pieces that we're putting out into the social uh, media spaces so that we have that brand recognition. So when we do come in and we're looking for them in just that time, they already know who we are. So that's the biggest trend that I think that healthcare needs to start shifting to. I have to speak to quite a few people and, you know, a lot of them are starting to make that transition, but it's been as of recent. So I think that there's a huge gap between these amazing sourcing teams and amazing TA teams who've been working on these highly competitive spaces to where healthcare is set. And, you know, even looking from a technology perspective, a lot of healthcare organizations are also behind that curve. You know, everyone's launching into AI at this point in time and or already established on AI and healthcare is kind of just now going, wait, what's this AI thing? Whereas that's one beautiful piece that Hire Easy offers is that it has the AI piece for sending out emails where it actually writes it for you, saves you a ton of time. My team loves it. And I heard that there's a couple other uh, companies out there that are using the recruitment space that are now starting to move to having AI write a lot of those correspondences. But I can say that as far as my knowledge, Hire Easy was one of the first. How would you say that you have taught your team how to utilize AI and different technologies, but continue to keep candidate experience top of mind so you don't sound like a robot, but right. be able to scale a system in order to get an effective recruiting strategy done. That, it, that was a challenge. You know, I had a learning curve, obviously, with AI. Um, no way, shape, or form. I'm going to say I'm an IT expert um, and know everything about AI. So a lot of it was me and my own time kind of going, okay, let's see what I can do here. And then reading a lot of the information I was putting out, I'm like, man, that sounds really canon. Okay, let's try it a different way. So what I think the best strategy, if you're going to leverage AI, is know that it is a program writing this letter. And you know that as far as I'm aware, at least, that uh, programs are not capable of having emotion. So really putting the information you, you need into the system, putting in the, the key certifications, education experiences that you need for a specific role, and then doing a double check on it, you know, kind of go in and go, okay, let's use this cool setting feature and let's take some of these words that make it sound a little can and let's just kind of tweak it here and there. But I've noticed even from a time perspective, just going in, tweaking it and saving that as a potential um, outreach for, you know, a mass it still has that personal touch to it and doesn't sound as can. So it's really just going back, kind of looking at it and thinking, if you were a candidate and you were reading it, how would you feel about this? I know that I've gotten some that have come into my emails that I've read and I'm like, that was absolutely written by a computer. Um, and then some, you're like, someone really took a lot of time to write this. And you want to find that, that space right in between, right? Where you are capable of using AI to save time and productivity for your team, but the same token, you don't want to be over-reliant on it where you pull out all of the personality that you want to portray in that email. And that's one thing that I've always told my team um, is be yourself in your email because there's nothing worse than someone saying, hey, this sounds great. And they get on the phone and you sound 100% different from, different from the email that you sent. Because then they know that there's a disconnect. And that is definitely something that is a dissatisfier for a lot of folks. They want that personality. They want that person to be true, regardless if it's in writing or the phone. And those two have to match up to a certain degree. Typically, healthcare recruiters face a large volume of open positions per recruiter. How do you or how does a recruiter in this healthcare system prioritize automation to alleviate administrative tasks and allow recruiters to focus on those requisitions or focus on the candidate? specifically a building a relationship with them and kind of taking away that administrative task that go along with recruiting. Yeah, that, that is definitely a challenging piece. Healthcare itself is highly regulated, um, as, as I'm sure you know. And with that being as highly regulated as it is, there are a lot of nuances of information you have to ensure that we gain from, you know, certifications to vaccinations to, you know, degrees so that we have it all on file. So if we do get audited by one of the bodies, um, JCO or, you know, uh, OFFCP, whoever it might be, if they are doing the audit that we do have information that supports. So there are some very tricky pieces to it in trying to lower the amount of administrative burden and ensure that the recruiters are able to make those personal connections and personal relationships with candidates. So 
thankfully, when we were speaking with our executive leadership and having some conversations about TA and kind of where we wanted that growth to occur and how we wanted to TA to support the overall enterprise. When we were looking at that and we kind of spoke to executive leadership, we use a lot of different benchmarking from a couple of different organizations that are out there to kind of get an idea of what is that magic number from all these different bodies who are taking this data from all over the place. We were looking at cross industries. We were looking at healthcare specific, trying to figure out what that magic number was. The blessing that occurred for us is that our executive leadership said, here's what we're going to do. Go ahead and build a, a larger team. So they recognized from the information that we were sharing with them that one, there is a, a secret number when it comes down to how many requisitions that each recruiter have so that they can build those relationships, have those conversations and really work that requisition versus sitting there going, oh, that one looks qualified. Let me send it over to the hiring manager. That looks close. Let me send it over because that's just a waste of time for everybody. The recruiters looking at ones that probably aren't even qualified, or if they are, there's some things that we probably should have picked up in that resume that we didn't because they're in such a hurry. So let me get these out. Let me get these over to that hiring manager. And the hiring manager sitting on the other side going, why are they even sending these people to me? They don't have this. They don't have that. So the blessing was we were capable of basically increasing our team size and lowering the overall requisitions per um, recruiter. And then we siloed out those recruiters to where they were working in specific service lines. We have dedicated recruiters just for the ICUs across our entire system. We have a dedicated recruiter for all labor and delivery, NICU, PICU, you name a specialty, we have someone designated for that. And then we actually move that just from the clinical space. We move that also into the business area where we have one person who works mainly in business leadership. So they're looking at your revenue cycle, um, your patient financial services, HR, we have a designated person for that. And then we have a uh, dietary services, uh, right. bioengineering. We've kind of segmented them all out. So that one, from a requisition load, it's not overwhelming. Two, that they're also working on light positions. So if you have six labor and six is probably an understatement, but let's say you have six labor and delivery openings for an RN, you're really only working one requisition. You're looking at candidates just for labor and delivery. You're not, I'm doing labor and delivery. Uh, I'm doing med surge. I'm doing bioengineering because none of those made sense together. So what we did was do a realignment where you're working on more light positions. So if someone's a good candidate for one of your openings, they're a good candidate for almost all of your openings. So that was sure. one of the processes that we did was kind of a realignment. Um, and I hate to say siloing, but it, to a certain degree, you could say that, but it was really just aligning folks so that we could build relationships with those hiring managers where when we're doing intakes, it's not a surprise on who's doing the intake with the hiring manager. Um, we know exactly what they're looking for, how they're looking for it, what their interview process looks like. We are subject matter experts of that entire process throughout the organization for that specific. So that was one of our, our pieces we added, and it's been absolutely phenomenal and highly successful. When you're teaching recruiters how to own those intake meetings and drive those meetings with those business leaders. What tools, what resources, what data do you teach them to bring to the table to drive that narrative, to increase that partnership with the business leader? Yeah. So um, there's a lot of tools out there that you can leverage. There's quite a few of them for just market data, especially if you're looking just in, you know, certain areas, like in our case, Orange County, Los Angeles, that's kind of where, or that's where all of our facilities are predominantly located. So that's really the market that we're looking at. But one thing that has been a great tool for us is Hire Easy does offer that functionality where we can take a look at what's going on in the market. We can see where people are transitioning. What are those golden periods that we want to approach somebody about a potential a potential position based off of what that trend looks like for whatever that job title is. Um, gives us ideas of experience level, gives us ideas of, you know, how many are in the area, what schools they went to. So it gives us a lot of data points of where we could target. And also it makes it where our recruiters, instead of just being, let me push resumes, let me talk to people, tell you they're great. They're more, they're more consultative now where they're approaching those calls going, I have all this really great information. I want to share this with you. So you know what we're looking at. And it usually gives a really good perspective to the hiring managers. Okay. This is not a position we're going to fill tomorrow. This might take a little bit of time. And here's the rationale as to why. One of our beliefs in TA is the more informed the hiring manager is, the more that the hiring manager knows what the market looks like, the more understanding they are of our process and how we're trying to find those best candidates versus just force feeding them a bunch of resumes that don't make any sense. So leveraging those data points have been critical. Uh, also, there's a couple other tools that are out there. There's an aggregate tool that basically pulls all the data from every posting in whatever region you're looking at. Really cool tool. And with that, it gives us like compensation ranges that are being posted because California passed a law where we have to have those posted, which is been amazing for us. <laughs> now we know exactly what our competitors are doing instead of just kind of guessing. So that's been great too, where we kind of know, okay, are we on market from a compensation standpoint? I mean, obviously there's going to be those outlier facilities that we know pay way more than anybody else in the market. But let's look at our real competitors because that's an outlier. Let's look at our real competitors and we're able to go compensation, we look good. Okay, let's look at their job descriptions. Let's look, look at what their requirements are, see if we're matching up. If we're looking for something way above then that's a conversation we need to have with that hiring manager. Go, okay, I see you're looking for this certification. Um, we kind of glanced at what all these other facilities are doing and no one else is looking for that certification. Can you help me understand why? And that gives us kind of that why space. And then it also allows us to ask questions like, okay, is that something that we can train them in? Is that something that we can help them get once they come on board? So it's given us a lot of flexibility in what used to be the status quo for the hiring manager to where it kind of opens their eyes a little bit and they're not looking just at Memorial Care and what we've done. Now they're seeing the entire market going, why are we asking for that? If everyone else is in, is that something we can do? And then they really start changing kind of their vision of what those hiring needs are. And, you know, healthcare is 
amazing place to work. I've loved it for all the years that I've been in it. But one thing I have noticed is sometimes over time, the hiring managers just kind of put on the blinders. It's like, this is the way we've done it. This is why we've done it this way. And then it takes that outside person to go, hey, but look at all this. Look at this cool picture. And let's see if we can challenge that status quo and see if there are some flexibility in. It's sometimes a situation where I'm not going to look at the data because I don't want to be proven wrong or proven different. So I'm not going to even look at the competitors because it might, they might be paying a dollar more or whatever it may be. Yeah, it's it's that. And I also think that there was an education component we, where we had to add where it's like, you can look within the walls of memorial care and you're going to see the same picture, right? Sure. It's really expanding their vision to go, oh, wait, there are competitors out there. We can get all this information about what they're doing. Oh, wait, I didn't know we could do that. So it's really that education also. Is it? It's not the, I'm doing it my way. I don't care what they're doing all the time. That does have some play into it. But the other pieces, them just not having the information and knowing that we can pull it. So those have been some additional ads that we've done over the past year or so to the team to make them have that more consultative approach going into those intakes going, here's where our barriers are going to lie. Here's some of the things we're seeing out there. And it's been kind of an eye-opening experience for a lot of our hiring managers. And to be honest with you, they've really bought into our overall TA structure for the most part. And they're like, okay, you got the data. Here's what we need to do. I get it. Let me see what I can do on my side. Let me have some conversations and figure out what we can do. And we've seen a lot of successful changes occur, just the overall nursing operations primarily and some of the other operations where they're making those adjustments, which is making our time to fill and our speed to hire a lot faster because we don't have to jump over all the barriers that we were before. What do you think the biggest driver in, for example, let's just say a nurse of making the move? Is it a you know, compensation where it's, hey, I'm going to pay this hospital system is going to pay a dollar more right down the road. Is it a, a company culture? Is it a brand working for, I want to work for Memorial Care. What is it? What's the biggest drivers for people moving jobs currently right now? You know, I mean, compensation is always at the top of the list. You know, no matter what industry you go into, everyone's looking, you know, to increase their overall earnings. So I would say compensation is obviously there. But interestingly enough, we launched a survey piece on our careers page, which has given us a lot of really great intel. It's basically asking questions that are along with why are you looking? What are you looking for? Um, what were some of the motivators to coming to our careers page? And then it goes into some DEI areas so that we get a better understanding of what that looks like coming into our careers page and what our application flow looks like from um, those perspectives. But what we've seen lately, and the reason I'm saying lately is because I actually just looked at this data last week with our uh, careers page team. So we were looking through it. And I'm like, interesting. So compensation's moved to number two. Culture and benefits are almost neck and neck for number one. So what I'm seeing, at least from our data, is that culture is becoming more significant to individuals where they want to go to a place that, you know, isn't going to work them to the bone, even though they're getting tons of extra money. You know, a lot of people want that work-life balance. That's the struggle right now is trying to find that. And that's one thing as an organization from a cultural standpoint that we've really been working on is ensuring that our nurses, our non-nurses, they all have that feeling like I'm off the clock, I'm off the clock. They're not going to call me and say, hey, I need you to come back in because we're working on adequate staffing throughout the entire organization to make sure it makes sense and that we're capable of supporting that. So culture and benefits have been the top two uh, as of kind of trending that way. Compensation set on uh, as number one, I'd say post-pandemic, you know, probably a good six to eight months. It was all compensation. Now it's slowly starting to shift over to that culture and benefits are more of what individuals are looking for. Now, I know that, you know, from whatever age demographic you're looking at, that fluctuates, right? You know, the younger, younger demographic, they're looking at the compensation. That was their number one, because we do have the capability of seeing that data um, that they report on kind of where their demographic age wise is. And compensation for like newer folks coming into healthcare, that's what they're looking for is, you know, the max amount of money I can get. But as they start getting experiences where the benefits and the culture really start standing out as this is what I'm looking for. I know I can go somewhere else and make great money, but I want that work-life balance. I want that happy working environment. I want to feel like the organization cherishes me for the work that I'm bringing to the table. So those are the pieces that have really been standing out as of late. Do you think your sourcing campaigns and messaging to these candidates are different based on the demographic, maybe the age, because the drivers of them in their new employer is different? To a certain extent, that is true. Um, you know, when we're really targeting like new grads, then we're a little bit more obvious about uh, certain aspects. Like, you know, this is what compensation would look like. This is what, you know, the with them, right? What can, what can we do for you? And that's really what we're trying to spell out to them is what we can do for you. So new to specialty, guess what? You're brand new as a nurse. Guess what? We'll throw you into an ICU so you get that experience right off the bat. You don't have to go through those, those steps in between. So that's a huge selling point because they know that once you're in a specialty, now all of a sudden the overall value for you moving into, let's say another organization, the compensation is going to be higher. So we're really more upfront with the compensation and what we can do for you with a younger demographic. Now that, that what we can do for you exists through all the different areas, but it's just at different amounts. So the younger demographic, here's what we can do for you. Here's everything we're going to give you. Here's what, how we're going to help you progress your career and become this amazing nurse um, that's going to be well compensated. Then when you're starting to go into the different demographics where people are starting to think about families, they're starting to think about what they need going forward, where that compensation is important, 
but yet the benefits are more important because sick children, things of that nature. So then we start approaching that slightly different where we're really talking to the culture of the organization and the benefits that we offer, because those are more in alignment with what they're looking for in that time and space. So it does have some change between the two, even with our new grads. So we make sure that we talk about our culture and we also make sure they have the benefits, but we've noticed that the benefits don't really get it reviewed as much. It's usually compensation, culture, and what you can do for me. And then the second one is what you can do for me from different perspectives. What can you do for me from a benefits perspective? How much is your, how much are your benefit premiums? How much does, how much does, is it for me to enroll my family? How much is it if I have to go see a primary care physician or I have to go to the ED or I have to be treated? That's more of what they're looking at because instead of looking at compensation up front, they're looking at it more on the back end. Like, yes, my compensation might be, I don't know, $60 an hour where I really would like 65, but looking at our benefits, it's like when I'm saving a whole lot more on the benefits than I were when I currently am. So it's really where that compensation sits. Is it on the front end or is it on the back end? That's what, how you have to kind of approach those. Let's switch over and having a recruiting hat on. What advice would you offer to individuals who are just starting their career in the recruiting field and want to get into healthcare recruiting specifically? You know, the, the piece about getting into healthcare is you have to be willing to work. And I know that sounds kind of strange. You're like, well, I'm just a recruiter. There is so many strange acronyms and there's so many regulatory rules in place that we have to comply with. So if you're looking to get into healthcare, that's the first thing you need to figure out is, okay, am I up to a task where they could say, I need, you know, a a CLS and MLT and know those differences. Is there a difference? Depending on where you are regionally, yeah. But in one California license and one might not be, that's your big difference. But there are so many acronyms you have to learn. And in fact, I've been in this industry for, I'm about to date myself, a long time. Let's just leave it at that, a long time. And there are still acronyms that come up. I'm like, what does that mean? So it's really an interesting environment that's heavy acronym driven. So knowing that that's going to be your first hook to get over is learning a lot of those because nobody in healthcare speaks a normal language. It is acronym after acronym after acronym. Um, And then when you ask them, they kind of look at you like, you don't know what that means. Everybody knows what that means. So that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle is healthcare is different. Um, You know, and everyone's like, well, if you can recruit, you can recruit. And that's true. You have the basic foundation to recruit. But in healthcare, the reason it's different is because some of the areas that you're recruiting in, it could work bringing someone from a different state, but it's all so state regulated that I could find a nurse in Montana and they cannot work in a position in California because the regulations are different. So it's having the capability of understanding some of those regulatory bodies and saying, okay, well, why can't I? This is why I can't because they don't have this. They don't have that. Okay. So now I have to reset and then I have to start figuring out what those states are. And the other piece that's probably the most significant and probably the most important is learn from the people around you. You know, if you come into an organization as a health care recruiter, partner with a veteran recruiter who's been in healthcare for a long time. They can explain all those acronyms. They can explain exactly what it means. They can break all of that down. But the most important piece is they can give you the why behind a lot of stuff because we've lived through it. We've lived through some of these changes where it's like, oh, wow, that's new. And five years from now, people come in the industry are like, why do we do that? Oh, well, there's this regulation that got put in place uh, about five, 10 years ago. And here's a why. And that always is very helpful where you kind of have that why. And learning that healthcare does speak a different language when you're reaching out to you know, folks who are in that clinical space, you have to know that language and you have to meet them in that language. Because I, I have done this before where I've sent out an outreach email and I use the whole phrase and then they responded back and you meant acronym, question mark? Because then it makes you wonder, does everybody know all the acronyms or they only know it as acronyms? There is a, a significant learning curve moving into healthcare. But if you are with the right organization and you have individuals who are on your team that are apt saying, let me help you, you can be successful in healthcare. But just knowing coming into the space, there is a significant learning curve. If you could give three top characteristics of a highly successful healthcare recruiter? What are those three characteristics? That's a great question. The first one's going to be, you have to be a grinder. And by grinder, obviously it's more of like a baseball term, but you have to be that one that no matter how many times you fail, you pop right back up on your feet and you keep going after it because healthcare can be really tough. Sometimes you have great weeks where you're like, I hired six nurses the next week. You're like, I had six nurses to climb my offer, you know? So it's really being able to grind and continue that pace because the market's not going to change. You have to be grinding away on a daily basis, finding those candidates, looking for those candidates, presenting those candidates. But the next one is being nimble. You have to be able to be nimble, not get set in ways because as recruiting changes, as it continuously does, regardless of industry, but as it changes in healthcare, you have to adapt quickly. And that is a challenging piece is learning when to adapt and how fast to adapt. Um, Like I said earlier, healthcare always runs a little bit behind the trends, but that is one thing that makes our recruiters really stand out is their openness to change and being nimble with their approaches. When I'm coaching our sourcing team and coaching some of our recruiters, it's like, okay, that worked yesterday. That's amazing. I'm glad that worked yesterday. But just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it's going to work today. And healthcare kind of gets in that groove where they're like, well, this works. Let's just keep pushing that along. It's not always going to work. And really having that nimbleness to make adjustments and change so that we're keeping up with the times is really important. And the third one is compassion. And the reason I bring compassion into it is because when you're talking to nurses, a lot of them have gone through some significant changes organizationally where they are currently or where they were. 
Um, they've gone through a lot through, you know, their overall career. They've seen a lot and really being compassionate and listening to them. That's one thing that gets lost that I've noticed in recruitment is sometimes individuals get into a position where it's kind of like, this is what I need to say and when I need to say it. And this is what I need to present and when to present it. Really meeting that person where they're at, talking to them, not about, hey, I got this amazing opportunity. Let's just talk about that. Learn from them, learn about them because you will learn more that you're going to use down road in recruitment from them. And secondly, you can hear their story and it takes away that it's an application, it's a piece of paper. And it puts a personality and a person with it. So then you have that value add to you as a recruitment going, this is a person that I think is a great fit for my organization. And here's why, because I had those in-depth conversations and was hearing some of their, their stories and was really compassionate to the ones that were difficult and, and challenging for them and, and really hearing what, what their challenges are and ensuring this is the right fit for them as an organization. Throughout your career and having that framework of teaching those three things to your team, you probably encountered various leadership styles that shape your style. Can you tell us about a leader you've worked with who really made an impact on your recruiting journey, whether it's now or present, past, whatever it may be? Man, that's putting me on the spot here because both of them, the two that come to mind, we're probably going to see this. <laughs> There's certain aspects from both that I like to bring forward. I don't think I can narrow it to just one because both of them have supplied such amazing concepts, amazing ideas for me that have really helped me move forward as a leader. One was from a, a previous organization that I worked for, and he had this interesting knack where anything that I brought forward, he was always like, okay, and what's that going to do for the organization? I'm like, well, this is what my plans are, and this is how I think it'll pan out. And he really gave me wings. It was that interesting. He's like, I will let you fly as high as Icarus, but just know if you get too close to the sun, you're coming back to the ground. But he gave me a lot of space to function and operate and try things just to see if they work or fail. As long as I was capable of explaining where we failed, why we failed, and how to make sure we didn't fail again, then he was fine with it. It was really him just saying, go get them, kid. You got, you got this. You can figure this out. If this is what you think is going to work, let's see what happens. So that's where I got a lot of the sourcing side. And, and what was his name? His name was Scott Mumbert. He works for a cottage health out of Santa Barbara, um, California. And when I was working with him, he really gave me those wings. Uh, they did not have a sourcing component. And he was like, hey, I heard about this really cool conference and this is how it all started. Heard about this really cool conference called SourceCon. Have you ever heard of this? I'm like, yes, I've heard of it. He's like, you want to go? I'm like, seriously? Yes, I want to go. So he's the one who really kind of expanded that. And I came back with all these things. And, you know, he, amazing leader, technically wise, a lot of things I said, he was like, sounds good. Because I don't think he kind of grasped the entire concept of, I'm going to go find these people. This is how I'm going to do it. But he let me spread my wings and we had a lot of success there. And then my current vice president now, Moses Aguirre, he was another huge piece of my journey career-wise where he was at, have you ever thought of? You know, he's always been that voice. That, that's great. Have you ever thought of? Or I see what, what your thoughts are on this. Have you looked at it this way? So he's always been, and I don't want to say devil's advocate, but he's always been that one. Let me make sure that you're looking at this full circle because he knows I have a tendency to, this is the direction I'm going and I'm going that direction. But he's always been that voice of, hey, let's, let's pause for a second. You're about to run 50 million miles an hour. Let's slow you down for a second. Let's really chomp through this and make sure this is the direction that you want to head. But again, he's been another one is, here's your wings. You want to do it? Let's do it. But know that I'm going to ask questions. And he's been a really big, huge advocate for my career. He's really supported me. When I worked for him and when I wasn't working for him, he's always been kind of that mentor. I could, you know, text and say, hey, man, this is what's going on. You know, what are your thoughts? And he'd always say, well, these are my thoughts on it. But ultimately, it's your decision. You know, he never said I am the end all be all of any decision that's been made. He's more of let me make sure you're thinking this through. Let me make sure you're hearing from a different perspective. And here are my thoughts on it. Take them or leave them. That's where he's always left it. But uh, he supported me in a lot of different ways uh, throughout my career. Um, with him and in other organizations. And he's always been that person who's like, what are you up to? And he'd ping me out of the middle of nowhere, you know, middle of nowhere, like, hey, how's everything going? Let's chat for a little bit, you know? And he'd come to my office at another facility I worked with. He'd just show up and come in and sit down. And we'd talk for like four or five minutes about new technologies he's heard coming out, new things that I'm hearing that's coming out. And we've always had a slightly different relationship than, you know, this is my, my leader. It was more of, I'm your leader and I'm your mentor. And that's been huge in my life. And it is that piece that I'm trying to embody on a continuous basis. And I'm hopeful that any of my team members that are watching this or will watch this will actually state that that is exactly what I bring to the table because my goal, and this is going to sound so strange, but my goal is to train people and teach people everything that I know so that even if they do decide to leave this organization, I have put them in a better place to move to another organization. Or if they want to move up in this organization, they can take my job. That is my overall goal with all my team members is put them in the best position I can so that they can be successful no matter where they go or what they do. They're bringing a little piece of something that I taught them. Love it. I love that. You're, you're not teaching people to be, um, you know, following you with you're teaching people how to lead others. And that's what leadership's all about. Absolutely. Let's transition to the quick fire questions as we wrap up. Is there one recruiting tool software that your team can't live without specifically in healthcare recruiting? Ugh. Man, you're gonna make me narrow it down to one. I would... You can talk about a couple if you want. Yeah, I mean, you know, because healthcare spans so many different business areas. So we have our clinical setting, we have the business areas, we have you know, a multitude, we have clinics, we have a little bit of everything. So it's hard to say that there's a one 
tool that works for all of them. But, um, you know, I'm actually going to narrow this down to one and, and it's not a plug just because I'm talking to you. But um, since I've been on Hire Easy previous to it becoming Hire Easy when it was Hire Tool, I was a part of this. And, you know, I have found tons and tons of success utilizing it. And a lot of the tools that it's starting to bring forward now and a lot of the enhancements that are going into Hire Easy, it is a night and day difference from where I started eight, nine years ago to where it is today. And the tool just keeps getting better. And it allows our team to reach out to all those different aspects and areas and actually see profiles from uh, different websites, I believe. But it pulls in all that information. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop. For most everything that we could run across and, uh, you know, it's contact piece is huge. Um, I would say about 95 to 96%. I know that sounds really a weird percentage, but when it gets to that, that, we're seeing that those contacts are hundred percent happy. You know, there's a lot of sites out there that are really wrote, or a lot of companies and products that are out there like, Hey, we have all these and I've demoed them and I've tried some, and you're looking at about a 50% chance that those contacts are still valid. But uh, with higher ease, I've noticed that more often than not, you're actually going to reach out to somebody and you're actually going to hit their email box. And that email is more than likely going to get open because our, our hiring rates I mean, our open rates, I'm not going to say it's because we're just amazing at our subject lines, but our open rates are pretty amazing. So I think that, you know, us hitting them with that primary email address that is actually something that they really do leverage on a continuous basis has been extremely helpful. So kind of a plug and a lot of truth here, but I'd say Hire Easy is the one that I would still say is if I had to get rid of everything, and please don't put this idea in my, in, in my manager's head, but if I had to get rid of everything, I would remain with Hire Easy. The recruiting landscape right now has overtaken some rapid changes. A lot of people looking for work if you were hiring and interviewing for a recruiter on your team right now, what specific advice would you give the community right now of what you look for in preparation within that interview that can separate themselves from the rest? First and foremost, you know, if, if I'm having an opening for a recruiter, since we two have, do have two different business areas for our recruitment team, going back to those kind of realignment, um, we have the clinical space and we have the non-clinical space. So depending on which area really kind of dictates what I'm looking for. Um, obviously, you know, the first and foremost, if we if they have it, which would be amazing, is healthcare experience, especially the clinical side, because again, getting back to all the crazy acronyms and, and knowledge of nursing, that could be a challenge. But that's not the end all say all. Generally, what I like to see is individuals who have progressed in recruitment. You know, they might have started off as a recruiting assistant or an onboarding specialist where they're learning that backside. Then they moved into a recruitment role. Now it's like, well, that's really cool. Now they understand the backside because that's pretty much wherever you go, it's synonymous, right? That backside is always there, making sure we have all the documentation, all the information, getting them set up orientations, whatever it might be. So now they progress to a recruiter role and it's really seeing kind of that progress that they've had because in recruitment, like I said, you, you can't stand still. You know, you can be a great recruiting assistant and I'm not saying don't stay in that area if that's what your, your desire is, but seeing that there's some progression where they're trying to continue to elevate those skill sets. Now, I'm not looking for someone who's been, okay, I was a recruiting assistant, I became a recruiter, um, I went into the tech space, I recruited, now I'm a senior recruiter, now I'm an uh, executive recruiter. I'm not looking for all that, but just to see those incremental changes where you can tell that they're hungry and they're still trying to move to that next piece in their career, because that right there shows the tenacity that they have, that they really kind of have that focus of where they want to be. And if they're moving through those levels, that's a good indicator that they're going to come in and learn quite a bit from us as they're progressing in, in the recruitment roles. So really looking at, those pieces from a resume perspective, but when I talk to them is really where I would say I get the most out of what their capabilities are. I'm not one of those that's, let me ask you 50 million rapid fire questions and be like, oh, tell me about the time you did this and this and that. I prefer to have more of a conversation with them to learn more about them and kind of their thought process. Recruiters have to have that out of the box kind of capability where they're like, okay, well, this is the norm and it's not working. How am I going to figure out that next step? So to have some creativity, some imagination, some, what can we do next? How can I find a candidate? Do I really need to put on a sandwich board and go walking up and down the freeways? You know, really <laughs> at those different areas in that conversation of status quo is great. We can do that. If it's not working, I'm going to come up with some ideas. I'm going to use some imagination. I'm going to start doing some research. And I'm going to figure some other way to do it. So it's really having that ability to go. Yes, we can do it this way. It's not working. Let me find another way we can do it. So always having that imagination, that creativity um, in those conversations I have with them have been critical. So that's what I would say is if you're looking to move into healthcare, one, know that there is going to be a learning curve, but two, have some passion about what you're doing, have some compassion for the folks that you're going to be talking to, and always be willing to push that bar just a little bit forward, further, just to make sure that you're finding the candidates that are really needed for the organization. And that's where that creativity and imagination come in. Anything else that you want to share with the listeners as we wrap up? You know, I, one thing that has always been a huge piece in my mind is you know, I know there's competition between all these different organizations, regardless of industry. A lot of recruiters sit in these spaces and they're like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to talk to them. They're going to steal all our secrets. If you really do some research out there, a lot of those secrets are already out there. You know, typically if I'm doing something, you're like, oh, well, I heard Memorial Care is doing that. If you do some research, there's probably about 15, 20 other people who are doing the exact same thing. So 
I would say, let's try to knock down some of these barriers between us as recruiters. We could be this great network who can assist each other in filling opportunities. And I might be stealing this a little bit from SourceCon because I believe my first one, that was one of the huge talking points that they brought forward is that we're in a network, you know, what works for me in healthcare could work amazingly well for someone out of healthcare. You know, let's knock down those barriers and let's have some real conversations and talk about things. I mean, I'm open to talk to anybody. If you send me a message on LinkedIn, I'll be like, hey, let's chat. I don't have a problem making some time and kind of talking through some of your barriers and seeing if there's some ideas that I could help with because I've tried a lot. I failed a lot. I've learned a lot. And I'm more than happy to share that knowledge because at the end of the day, our, our job is to make sure that we're finding the right people for our organizations so that they're getting hired so that the organization is successful. And if there's any little piece that I can add or even a little inkling of a concept that might kind of spark something in their minds, I'm more than happy to do that. But that's the one thing I'd like to see is that we, we become more of a network and more of a community versus this, we can't talk to them because they recruit in the same space. You're in Nebraska. I am telling you right now, I am not looking for Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of my sure. that make it more of a community-based kind of feel versus this, we're all against each other. Hire Easy just came out with a Hire Easy community specifically for recruiters, sourcers, recruiting leaders in any industry. You don't even have to have a Hire Easy account to be a part of this community, but it's a one-stop shop to give information to the community, receive information, understand what's out there. The more you share, the more you gain. And I'm excited that you kind of repeated what everybody's thinking right now. Wholeheartedly believe it. Well, if we wrap up today's episode, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our special guest, Charles Carson, for sharing his valuable insights and expertise in healthcare talent acquisition. Charles, your commitment to mentoring talent professionals, your innovative approach of sourcing strategies is truly inspiring and excited to see the leaders that you've created on your team for years to come. So to our listeners, did uh, don't forget to tune in to the next episode every Monday. Come back to the Speak Easy podcast and please subscribe. Join the Up on Recruiting Academy and the Hire Easy community on our website. And until then, take care and keep striving for excellence in your recruitment endeavors.